What's up, y'all? It's Dr. Paul with Liberty Hill Comics, where I share my passion and over 40 years of experience comic book collecting, investing, and conservation with you. This is episode 13 for the conservation process of this copy of America's Best Comics number 12 from January 1945, the golden age of comic books. This has been a fun project, and this is the final episode. Today we're going to review all of the conservation work we've done on this comic book and reveal the final results. Thank you for joining me today. I appreciate all of the viewers, but especially those that take the time to like, subscribe, and comment on the videos. And in appreciation of subscribers, new and old, I'm currently running a free subscriber giveaway. All you need to do for a chance to win this awesome slabbed first appearance of Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., is subscribe to the channel, follow the link over to that video, and leave a comment there. Good luck! For this Golden Age conservation project, we're following my nine-step comic book conservation process. If you're interested in working on your own comic book conservation projects, check out that video for the overview. I start with this process for each conservation project, and we eliminate steps we don't need, and consolidate steps where possible. Step one is preparation. And in episode one of this series, we did a complete assessment of this comic book and developed a game plan for the conservation project. We also discussed the importance of this wartime book with the great cover by the incomparable Alex Schomburg and the rarity of this book with only 16 universal copies in the CGC census. We also reviewed fair market values for this book, and I disclosed how I acquired the book at auction for $151 plus shipping and taxes. During our assessment, we noted all the flaws of the book and flipped through every page, counted all the pages, noted any defect that we would need to work on. Overall, this comic was solid, but it came to us with a severe spine roll, off-white to cream pages, some tanning and stains, and a partially split cover, as well as the cover detached at the bottom staple. But worst of all was some hidden glue that held the cover to the first wrap and the staple. Based on the condition of the comic book and the presence of the glue, I believe this comic would likely have received a purple label, restored grade, of between 1.5 and 2.5 if we had submitted to CGC as it was. In fact, the seller, MyComicShop.com, also known as Lone Star Comics, had listed it for sale as Fair Good or 1.5. I purchase comic books regularly from Lone Star Comics, and they generally grade fairly conservatively. And personally, I think this book was 2.0 when I received it. But Lone Star, as good as they are, and I do think they're one of the best, they did miss the glue holding the cover to the first wrap. So it just goes to show no matter how experienced we are, we all make mistakes and miss things from time to time. And for the record, I did not even bother contacting them about the glue. Although it was not disclosed, and it absolutely should have been, I knew this was a low-grade book when I bought it, and I was delighted to only pay $151 for the book at auction. So even if they had offered a full refund with a return of this book, I would have declined because I thought this comic was such a great candidate for conservation, with or without the glue. Based on our assessment of the defects, we developed our game plan. First step was to be disassembly of the comic for dry cleaning and glue removal. After dry cleaning of the cover and first wrap, these two wraps would need to be treated to the glue removal process. Once the glue removal was complete, all of the wraps would get a combination aqueous wash with deacidification, after which we would perform any necessary mending of rips or tears with Japanese paper and wheat paste, using the same archival methods employed by museum curators on important pieces of art or historical documents. After mending, the wraps would be individually dried and cold pressed before the staples were replaced and the book refolded and pressed in the heat press. In episode two, we got to work in earnest. Firstly, I demonstrated the tools I used to remove staples and tips and tricks for getting a good outcome with staple removal 
focused on not damaging either the staple or the paper that it's holding together. The staples were generally in very good shape and we were able to reuse both of them. The lower staple had some dried glue and some paper pulp glued to it, so those had to be removed before we were able to reuse it. We used the solvent mixture recommended by Museum Sciences Corporation that we discuss in greater detail in Episode 5 to remove the dried polyvinyl acetate glue. I removed the staples and saved them for future reuse, being careful to preserve the orientation both top staple and bottom staple, but also top and bottom of each staple. Then, we were able to remove the inner wraps from the cover and the first wrap, which were still glued together. We set the inner wraps aside for future treatment and examined more closely the glue holding the cover and the first wrap together and just what it would take to separate the two. We decided it probably wasn't going to happen in the dry state, so we were going to have to do a wash, but we better dry clean before we wash. You always want to dry clean before wet cleaning because you don't want to leave any contaminants on the surface of the paper that your wet cleaning solvent will solubilize and could actually become embedded deeper within the paper. So I demonstrated the tools I use for dry cleaning and I dry cleaned the cover front and back with the first wrap still glued to it. Neither the front nor the back cover were especially soiled so all they needed was a light dry cleaning with a white polyvinyl chloride polymer eraser. I prefer the Pentel or the Mars Stadler. They both do a really good job removing dirt while not being too abrasive to remove gloss as long as you're careful. As you can tell by the condition, this paper is still quite fragile, so we're giving it a very light dry clean, especially around the edges. Once I've covered the white areas with the polyvinyl chloride polymer white eraser, I use a kneaded eraser to go over the colored areas. Very gently pulling it, checking often to make sure I'm not lifting ink, and just trying to make sure I remove any surface soils that are on top of the paper before wet clean so we won't drive them down into the paper. As I use the kneaded eraser, I double check my work in all the white areas and I'll switch back to the white eraser as necessary. And once the dry cleaning is complete, we are ready for aqueous bath. In episode three, we put the cover and the first wrap in the photo development tray between layers of Holitex for aqueous cleaning and deacidification. I reviewed the pertinent scientific literature and the chemistry involved in washing, deacidification, and leaving the alkaline reserve in the paper. I used calcium hydroxide as a deacidification bath. It's also a very light bleaching agent and it provides the alkaline reserve. To this, I added half of 1% by volume Triton X100, which is a mild non-ionic surfactant. I was hopeful that the glue might be water-soluble, but alas, it was not. We nevertheless were able to separate the cover from the first wrap in the aqueous bath. We then separated the cover and the first wrap and washed them each individually in separate photo development trays. Because we used a surfactant in the first wash, we performed a second wash to remove any surfactant residue before drying both the cover and the first wrap in the cold press. The partially split cover had split the rest of the way, and so I took a moment to very carefully align all the pieces and make sure that they were flat because after washing, we were going to cold press them, and I wanted them to be all flat with no flaps bent over during the cold press. We then perform the second wash with the same warm calcium hydroxide bath minus the Triton X100 
before drying both the cover and the first wrap in the cold press using paper towels under a slab of granite. I switch the paper towels frequently initially and then less frequently as the paper dries. As the paper dries, the calcium hydroxide reacts with carbon dioxide from the air to produce calcium carbonate that stays embedded in the paper to protect it from future acidification. This is known as the alkaline reserve. In episode 4, while we were waiting for some solvents to work on the glue removal from our first wrap, we assessed the cleaning and whitening of the cover after the first wash and decided to do some additional deacidification washes with one quarter saturated calcium hydroxide to further clean and whiten the cover. In episode 5, we got to work removing the fragments of the cover that were glued to the first wrap. We determined that the glue that was used on the cover and first wrap of this comic was probably polyvinyl acetate, also called white glue or school glue. Museum Sciences Corporation recommends a solvent mixture of 50-50 acetone and ethanol, to which is added 6% water by volume. After first testing to ensure our inks would not bleed in the solvent mixture, we applied the mixture to the entire page to ensure we did not develop tide marks around the areas from which we had to remove glue. We let the solvent do the work and it worked incredibly well. We were able to recover all of the paper fragments to later be reunited with the cover. This is remarkable given that these paper fragments were literally only half the thickness of a sheet of paper. Remember, if you use these solvents, they are volatile and use them only in a well ventilated area or with an appropriate P95 respirator specifically for organic solvents. After removing all of the paper fragments, we dried the first wrap using the same cold press method we do for deacidification baths. In episode 6, we reviewed the results of the glue removal on the first wrap and, regrettably, had some noticeable ink fade and some ink bleed as well. There was also some dried glue still present on the first wrap. To avoid further ink fade and because we were confident after so many washes there were no solutes left to move around to create a tide line, I decided to spot treat the remaining dried glue. I put the same 50-50 acetone ethanol with 6% tap water mixture in a syringe and placed blotting paper above and below the dried glue residue. I repeatedly applied just a drop of the solvent mixture and then applied pressure with the blotting paper, moving the paper frequently to get good absorption of the solvent mixture. After repeated applications, the dried glue was eventually completely removed from the first wrap. In episode 7, we reviewed the results of the two deacidification washes on the cover and also reviewed the before and after images of the glue removal that was performed off camera on the cover using the techniques from episode 6. Then it was time to reassemble the cover into one wrap with the reverse side up on some Holitex on my work mat. I wet the cover with a 25% saturated calcium hydroxide solution. I like to do the mending with the entire cover wet so that as it dries, it dries without the distortion that results from differential contraction during the drying process. Then, I carefully align the two halves of the cover for mending with Japanese Tengujo paper. I really take my time here, because although this can technically be undone if you don't get the pages perfectly aligned, every time you re-wet the page, you risk further damage to the paper, or ink fading, or bleeding. I'd like the work to look perfect and have everything be aligned so that I can get a conserved label. I place the paper fragments on the inside of the cover next to their respective locations in preparation for gluing them in place with wheat paste. I've pre-prepared some wheat paste following the manufacturer's instructions 
and use a number 5 sable brush to apply the paste. Once I've covered all of the areas that are to receive a paper fragment with wheat paste, I then carefully place the paper fragments in their precise locations. Now that all the paper fragments are glued in place, it's time to mend the two halves of the cover back together with the Japanese paper and thereby sandwich the paper fragments in place as well. I use the medium weight Tengujo that is 5 grams per square meter and you have to rip it to size. You never cut it with scissors because the sharp flat surface of the cut edge is more noticeable in the final work and we'd like our repair to be invisible or nearly so. I carefully brush the wheat paste from the center of the Japanese paper out toward the edge to get a nice flat finish and maximum strengthening of the resulting repair. After completing a long strip down the center of the cover, I use the same techniques to repair tears along the edges of the cover wherever necessary. Once the mending of the interior cover is complete, I dried the page between two pieces of Holitex in a wet press with paper towels and my repurposed block of granite. In episode 8, with the cover still damp from our mending of the front and back covers, I inspected the union of the two halves of the cover to make sure they were aligned perfectly. I had one small fragment of paper that was slightly misaligned. To correct its alignment, I wet it using our 25% saturated calcium hydroxide solution so I could gently shift the location to align with the cover graphics and then was ready to complete the paper mending on the obverse by placing some Tengujo paper over the split spine. While you may be able to get a good tear seal with Japanese paper only on the reverse, especially on a split cover that we are going to refold, I prefer to put Tengujo paper on the obverse as well. This ensures I have no ragged seam after I refold the cover to place it over the inner wraps. As with the tear seal we performed on the reverse, rip, don't cut your Tengujo. Here, I used a thinner strip because most of the strength will come from the wider strip we used on the reverse and we can be less obtrusive on the cover where it will be visible. Because the paper is still damp, I can get away without wetting the entire page for this mending step. While you may still get a little warping or shifting due to differential drying of the paper as the wheat paste sets up, you have to balance this against wetting the entire page and potentially weakening the union you've already created between the two halves of the cover. Again, I used wheat paste and my brush, applying the paste to the inside and brushing out toward the edge of the Japanese paper for a nearly invisible tear seal. Once I completed the tear seal on the spine, I completed others around the outside edges of the cover as necessary and then dried the page between two layers of Holitex with paper towels and my repurposed granite slab. In episode 9, I pulled the cover out of the Seal Masterpiece 350 that all of the pages go into for cold press after they are dried. Thrilled with the results of our washing, deacidification, and mending steps, I was ready to trim the excess Tengujo paper from the edges of the cover. I use a sharp, new scalpel blade and a clear plastic ruler so I can see the exact edge of the paper. I also use a strong LED light ring with 10x magnification to get an exact cut right along the edge of the paper. A little bit of patience here goes a very long way in the final presentation of the comic book. Because comic book covers are generally not perfect rectangles, I recommend making a total of six cuts rather than four. When cutting the top or bottom edges, cut these in two passes each with each pass covering what will be either the front or the back 
of the cover. After trimming, the cover goes back into the cold press. In episode 10, I demonstrated the technique that I used to deacidify, wash, and perform tear seals on the inner wraps. With each of the inner wraps, I performed a total of three deacidification washes in my photo development tray. The page was placed between two pieces of Holitex in the tray and a 25% saturated solution of calcium hydroxide in warm tap water was used to cover the page, which requires approximately 400 milliliters. I gently rocked the tray and performed a total of three washes of 15 minutes each. With each successive wash, the paper gets a bit cleaner and whiter, but I stopped at three because I don't want to get ink bleed through the paper, and in my experience there are diminishing returns after the third wash. Different comic books can require different wash conditions, so for each project I experiment with one wrap to develop the optimal wash and then perform that wash on all the rest of the pages for consistency. Once I had the page deacidified, I moved it to my work mat supported by the Holitex. I partially dried the page so it's still wet, but not fully saturated in preparation of performing tear seals. This provides just a bit better adhesion with the wheat paste in my experience. I perform tear seals as necessary using the same wheat paste and Japanese paper method that I used on the cover. Once all of the paper mending was complete, I dried the page using paper towels and my repurposed granite slab. Then I treated the other 11 pages in the same manner off camera. In episode 11, I demonstrated the method I used to replace the staples in the wraps after conservation which transforms our stack of pages into a saddle-stitched book again. I retrieved all of the pages from the cold press, where they were already stacked in proper order after I inspected them for alignment and ensured all of the Japanese paper had been trimmed properly. I placed them on my work mat and then pulled a page from the middle of the stack that had perfect staple holes. Then I place this page on top of the stack, keeping the orientation correct, and centered it perfectly. Then I used a needle, approximately the same diameter as the staple wire, to punch a hole through the paper stack. Taking care to punch the hole from the outside in, in the same fashion that the original staple punched the paper during manufacturing. Once I had done this, I replaced the page with the perfect staple holes back in the stack in the correct location. Then, I retrieved my staples and placed them into the stack, taking care to replace top to top and bottom to bottom and keeping the staple orientation correct. Once the staples were in, I flipped the stack over so I was looking at the centerfold and used my Delrin block to keep the stack tight while I bent the staple arms down into place with my thumb. I use a small wedge of bamboo to get the staples extra tight. Now I have a stapled stack of pages ready to be folded back into a comic book. In episode 12, I reviewed my humidity chamber setup in preparation for putting the fold back in this copy of America's Best Comics number 12. After leaving the comic in the humidity chamber for 24 hours, it was ready to be folded. I pre-cut a magazine backer board with cutouts for the staples, and I cut the backer board the width of the folded comic. Placing the magazine backer board into the centerfold, and holding the comic in my left hand, I pulled the comic over the backer board and put sheets of SRP above and below the comic to protect it from the direct heat from my tack iron. I used my tack iron set at about 250 degrees Fahrenheit to very gently 
put some heat and pressure into the fold. As I applied light heat and pressure, the fold began to form, and I continued to pull and pinch the pages to get the proper alignment. Each time I flipped the newly formed book, I double checked the alignment of the fold and applied more pressure each time until I had a fold where I wanted it. Then it was time to put the comic book in my press. I used my standard buffer above and below, two magazine backer boards with a sheet of SRP between the backer boards and the comic cover. In the center fold of the comic, I used the same magazine backer board that I had used to form the fold. No additional buffer was used between the cover and the first page of the comic because the paper was already super flat from all the time it spent in the cold press and I didn't want to stress the spine that was held together with Japanese paper. The press was only 12 minutes at 60 degrees centigrade. I let the book cool in the press overnight and now, finally, after weeks of work, we get to see the final result. So as I pull the book out of the press, I'm really happy and let's take a closer look on my workbench. The book is clean, it's straight, it's now strong and can be handled without concern for damaging it. It was originally estimated at a somewhere between a 1.5 and a 2.5 restored grade because of the glue. I think we've dramatically improved the condition. The one disappointment I have is this first wrap is a bit faded and has some color bleed. That's because the glue removal was a difficult job and we didn't get a perfect outcome on that wrap. But otherwise, I'm over the moon with the result here. These pages are supple, they're bright, the inks are incredible. The pages have been deacidified and they now contain an alkaline reserve that will protect them from future acidification. We have great stories by all the heavy hitters from Neater Publications, including a lot of Nazis getting their asses kicked all over the place. Really an incredible result. We were able to reuse the original staples with just very minimal cleaning. Really, if it hadn't been for the glue, we wouldn't have had to do a cleaning at all, but we had to use a solvent to remove the glue and the paper pulp that was stuck to the lower staple. The Tengujo Japanese paper repair is nearly invisible. Almost every one of these pages has Tengujo paper repairs on it, and you can't see them as a casual observer here. There is a slight milkiness on the spine when viewed in the correct light, but we're not trying to hide the fact that this is a conserved book. It's a book that was saved from a really tragic state and preserved for the next century, and we're proud of that. So I don't put Tengujo to distract, but I also don't try to hide the repairs because we don't want to misrepresent the book as anything other than a nicely conserved Golden Age book coming up on 80 years old. As we've discussed, it's also an exceedingly rare book. Only 16 universal copies in the CGC census, one restored. I'd like to submit this one and presuming that my work passes muster and is considered professional, should be a conserved grade from CGC. And I'm really not concerned in the least what the grade might be because anything we would be, get back would be a huge upgrade over the way that this book started, or at least the way that we received this book. Here's that last wrap, the first wrap. You can see that ink fade. My only real regret on this book, otherwise beautiful. Nice alignment of the pages, beautiful staple placement. Glad we got to reuse 
the original staples and they look beautiful in the spine. Have a nice fold. Just overall couldn't be more pleased with the outcome of this book. As we look at some close-up images of the front and back on white cardstock and a before and after of the cover, I want to tell you how much I've sincerely appreciated having you along for this journey. I'm looking forward to starting a new conservation series soon and hope you'll join me for my next project. And join us over on the Facebook comic book conservation community as well. Most of the materials I use for this conservation are available from Amazon in the affiliate links below if you need any of them for your own conservation efforts. If you have any questions or comments on this video or really anything in the series, please let me know below. Tune in for a new conservation series soon, and if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and until next time, take care of one another.